touch this here during the, is a lot is Good morning and welcome to worship at Good Shepherd Christian Church. We're glad you're all here and all of you that are worshiping online, we're glad you're with us today too. This is the third Sunday of Advent and so we gather together for Peace Sunday and we know that not all in the world is peaceful but we also know that there is something being born and we know that we are making space for. We know that God doesn't promise that all difficult struggles will go away, but God does promise to be present with us in those struggles. So we especially remember that and hold on to that today. In light of the tornadoes, the news that we've all heard, most of us have heard, the tornadoes that have really wrecked havoc amongst, now we're hearing six states, um, but especially the western part of Kentucky. And so as we gather on Peace Sunday, I strongly encourage each of you to prayerfully give to Week of Compassion for Relief Aid for all those who have had destruction to their homes, to their businesses, for those who are struggling. We have two sister congregations that I'm aware of, Mayfield, Kentucky, First Christian Church Mayfield, their, their sanctuary was devastated. Um, beyond recognition. And the one thing I saw this morning that survived without any damage is their communion table. Um, so to support them, I also know several disciple pastors in Bowling Green, Kentucky, where the church is okay, but they have a lot of church members who have had devastation for their homes. So again, you can go to our website, to goodshepherdchristianchurch.org, and if you click on more up at the tab in online giving, you will see Week of Compassion there. You can give directly to Week of Compassion through our online giving. You can write a check this morning, and it can go in our offering box. Just write Week of Compassion down on the memo line. But our dollars have very little overhead. Everything you give goes to Relief Aid for Disciples of Christ and other congregations um, that have had the damage. So... Please be lifting them in prayer, everybody affected. Those who have had loss of life, those who've had damage, those who've just been through the traumatic experience. Hold them all in prayer, and then let's act. Let's give to support and show them our love. Now, I also know that we're coming up on something. If this is the third Sunday of Advent, we've only got one more, and then it's Christmas Eve. And so I want you... You are people who worship to invite others, but to also have information so you can make an informed decision on how to worship Christmas Eve. We will be holding in-person worship here at 7 p.m., and as you might have seen in the announcements as they were scrolling through, here is how we plan to do it. We will all be masked on Christmas Eve. We will continue to distance every other pew and at least three feet between each family unit. We will sing two congregational hymns together, all masked. We will have, as we do today, have our air filters going that have an ionizer that help clean the air. Um, they're large enough units to cover all the, the volume of the sanctuary. We will light candles to sing Silent Night on Christmas Eve, but we will extinguish them in bowls of water. We will have those stationed around so that we ask, please do not at all in a pandemic remove your mask to blow out your candle. Again, we will extinguish them in bowls of water. And if we have a lot of people coming, we will also have an overflow area on Christmas Eve. We will have the, um, the fellowship hall open with chairs also spaced out so that each family unit is three feet apart from each other with an air purifier going in there with a big flat screen monitor that will be streaming what we see online as well. 
So with knowing all of that, we invite you to worship safely with us. And for those that want to worship from the safety of their own home, it will go on YouTube at 7 p.m. when we start worshiping here, but you could also worship at 9 p.m. on Christmas Eve. You could worship at 10 p.m., whatever your flow is for your family. We welcome all and are glad that you're part of what we do and how we lift up the God that we love so much. And today, we're talking about John the Baptist. John says, prepare ye the way, right? You know, he also baptized new converts, and he invited them to live with changed hearts and changed lives. And when asked how to do that, his answers, they all point to making sure that no one is cheated, no one is left without basic necessities of life, including the right not to be harassed. So a full life of joy, which the prophet Isaiah that we'll hear describes as an ever-flowing spring, it's the birthright of the children of God. And may we act to make it so. I invite our choir to come forward to present our threshold music. We offer the light of joy to illumine the door of welcome. May this light shine in our hearts, in our lives, and in our church. May joy awaken us to possibilities and lead us to greater hospitality. There is room in this inn, a house for the holy. We're doing something different at Advent where we take a moment 
to greet each other with the peace. And so pandemic safe wise, we say these words together and then I'll invite you to stand and give a sign of peace to one another and to those that are worshiping online with us through the camera. The joy of Christ be with you. Please stand and give a sign of peace or a hand of prayer hands or a wave to one another. God be with you. Please stand again and uh, join in singing our first carol, the first one up. children that we might have here today or children of heart if you want to come join me we're doing a children's time that is for our children that are worshiping online as well so we know that we have other children at home safely worshiping if anybody here wants to join me you are welcome to okay so we are doing for those who are worshiping with us online we have something that we're doing today. You remember I had a box last week. Do you remember the box? Anybody else? Yeah. Well, today, being the third week in Advent, we remember that Advent is a season where we prepare, right? Glenn and I and Gabriel, we're preparing to move, so boxes are important for that. We're preparing for Christmas. Anybody else have boxes in their home that they might be filling and wrapping? Yeah, we're preparing. So we prepare our hearts, we prepare our minds for the most important gift, the coming of Jesus. And one way we can prepare is by making room, making room in our lives, making room in our hearts for what matters most. So we're gonna to start today with a call and a response. And for any of our friends who are worshiping with us that haven't worshiped with us last week or the week before, here's how the call and the response goes. I will say something, and then you respond each time with, we make room for Jesus. And I'm gonna rub my heart. We make room for Jesus. Can you do that? We make room for Jesus. Excellent. Okay. Now I'll start the call and response. Here we go. Make room for family. Make room for friends. We make room for Jesus. <coughs> uh oh. And frogs. 
Will my helper bring my water to me, please? <clears throat> I have some water I haven't drunk out of it yet. <laughs> okay, thank Please you. Yay for helpers. All right. <clears throat> Let me start that over. We make room for family and we make room for friends. We make room for Jesus. We make way for love that never ends. We make room for Jesus. Make room for others who need a hand. We make room for Jesus. Make room to listen, to listen, and to understand. We make room for Jesus. Amen. Well, here's our box. Can you see it? I'm using it as a table for my handy water. Water is good. Do you remember when we first talked about this box and we imagined? What was inside the box, anybody? Do you remember? There wasn't anything, was there? Just our imagination, right? But what did we imagine? Remember what we could imagine a box would be? A castle, right? We imagined a fort. Oh, and then we remembered on that first Sunday of hope, a box is filled with possibilities. So we explored hope. And when we have hope, we can see a world of possibilities when God is with us, even in a seemingly empty box. And then do you remember what Pastor Jill did with this box last Sunday? She did this at communion. She was talking about a big enough table for everybody. And then she flipped the box upside down like this. And she used it as a table, didn't she? And she said, we could have more and more tables. We could sit on the floor, and we could lay things out in front of us. We could have tables galore so that everybody has room. Huh. Well, on the third Sunday, we talk about joy. That feeling, that feeling of well-being that's deep inside of us, of joy. And joy is different than happiness. Happiness is when we smile with our faces, but joy, joy is when we smile with our hearts, when it comes from deep in, so that no matter what's going on, we can face it and breathe. Oh, wait a minute, I have joy. Wait a minute, I have a mic that just fell. Hold on. Really difficult. <laughs> okay. We have joy. So we are talking about joy, and it's different than happiness. Happiness, we can smile through a lot of things, but joy comes from inside, and it reverberates out. It's hard to think about joy at this time of year without thinking about all of the musical moments that cause and express feelings of joy. So this morning, we're going to reimagine our box, not as a table, but as a musical instrument. Anybody ever played the drums? This is our box. Drum roll, please. Everybody do it. It's our drum, our drum of joy. So we're going to play some Christmas rhythms together, OK? How about everybody, you can help me with this. Everybody at home, everybody here in the sanctuary. Let's drum out the clip-clop hooves of a donkey carrying Mary into the town of Bethlehem. Ooh, you're good. How about now? Let's imagine, oh, some of those frightened shepherds, when they saw the angel appear, their hearts must have been going, bum, 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 bum. And what about? When they heard the good news of the birth of Jesus, the shepherds were overcome with joy, and they ran to Bethlehem, didn't they? What would running sound like? Ah, oh, let's imagine the joy. The joy that we feel, the joy that we realize. Do you know that God has given each of us enough? God has given us enough. 
And that when we all share what we have, the world has enough. That brings me joy. That's not the message I hear when I see commercials between my streaming events, do you? I hear that I need to buy like the shiniest, newest thing, and I'd better hurry because there's a supply chain backup. Then I go, if I were a child, I'd say, oh, Santa, hurry, hurry. But you know what? God has given us enough. And whatever we get, we can share with our friends. And whatever they have, if they share with us, whoa, imagine all the cool games you're going to be able to play. Imagine when we have our favorite treat at Christmas. What if we share that? There's enough for everybody. Whoa. If we share, then there truly is enough for everybody. I love that. Hmm. Should we play a joyful rhythm on our box? Whatever you want. You all ready? Whatever's joyful to you, let's do it. Little dancing. I like it. You know what? When we let God's love in, when we really live out of that place, we can share joy. We can hold that and express the joy in the world. And sometimes we can even drum it. Sometimes we sing it. Sometimes we can do all three. If anybody has ever seen the newest movie, well, I don't know if it's the newest now, but there was a movie that came out that was by Manuel um, Lynn Miranda that was a kid's movie. And she says, I dance to the beat of my own heart. And she dances to her own personality, and she drums, and she sings, and she's this vibrant kid. It's amazing. What if we were all who God called us to be? What if we all let our colors shine? Some of our colors are kind of a pale blue or a pale pink. Some of us are softer. Some of us are vibrant purples and reds and blues and yellows and oranges, and we skip and dance and drum. And what if we recognize that's good? It's all good. What if we recognize if we share, it's beautiful? What if we recognize that what I need may not be what you need, but if we both help provide what you need, it's gorgeous? Hmm. Now, we're going to sing together as we close out our children's time. We're going to sing to the first new well, and thank you for helpers, because when you sing, water is really important. It's the tune of the first Noel, but it's slightly different words. Here, I'll sing this for you. And if my voice croaks, you can help at home, okay? Or help here in the congregation. It goes like this. Make room for joy. Make room for joy. Jesus is coming. Make room for joy. You ready to do it all together, everybody? Make room for joy. Make room for joy. Jesus is coming. Make room for joy. Thank you. That was beautiful. I want to remind all our children and our children of heart that could be older in age, we are gathering up gently used toys, something that you may have had but is in great condition, and you're ready to pass that joy on to somebody else. We're going to fill this box together. So bring your gently used toy next Sunday. Or if you aren't here but you have something, let Pastor Jill or myself know and we'll collect it and we will make sure it goes to children who will really appreciate that for Christmas. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. Our first scripture today is from Isaiah chapter 12, verses 2 to 6. God is indeed my salvation. I will trust and won't be afraid. Yea, the Lord is my strength and my shield. 
He has become my salvation. You will draw water with joy from the springs of salvation. And you will say on that day, Thank the Lord, call on God's name, proclaim God's deeds among the peoples, declare that God's name is exalted, sing to the Lord who has done glorious things, proclaim this throughout all the earth, shout and sing for joy, city of Zion, because the Holy One of Israel is great among you. Our second scripture is from Luke chapter 3, verses 10 to 18. The crowds asked him, What then should we do? He answered, Whoever has two shirts must share with the one who has none, and whoever has food must do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. They said to him, Teacher, what should we do? He replied, Collect no more than you are authorized to collect. Soldiers asked, what about us? What should we do? 
He answered, don't cheat or harass anyone and be satisfied with your pay. The people were filled with expectation and everyone wondered whether John might be the Christ. John replied to them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than me is coming. I'm not worthy to loosen the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The shovel he uses to sift the wheat from the husks is in his hands. He will clean out the threshing area and bring the wheat into his barn, but he will burn the husks with a fire that can't be put out. With many other words, John appealed to them, proclaiming good news to the people. Thanks be to God for that reading. I have my handy water up here in case I need it. I'm going to put it on my table, just in case. How much is enough? How much is enough? Now, we all see the commercials. They tell you that you could have the latest trend, which I am not wearing. They tell you it could make you look more slender, more sleek, more casual, more fun, more dressy, more classy. They tell you that your house, as beautiful as it is, you could redo the whole thing. They tell you your car, it's so great, but it's not as great as this new model. They tell you that your iPad or your MacBook or your laptop or your desktop or your fill-in-the-blank, Kindle and everything else, is good, but it could be so much faster and sleek and cool. Your car could be so much better than it is. How much is enough? They tell you that your food is good, but look at this luscious food. It could be even better. They tell you your hair, as much as you use a great conditioner and you all washed it today, and you look fabulous, by the way. You look fabulous. It could be better, they say. It could be luxurious, like silk. Huh, how much is enough? How much is enough? You may have heard me talk about this documentary before. There was a documentary that came out maybe about five years ago that actually asked the question and studied around the world, what makes people happy? What makes them happy? Was it money? Was it fancy, luxurious apartments in New York City or London or wherever it might be? Was it fancy homes? Was it the nicest car? Was it travel? Was it laying on the beach in a luxurious resort with a fabulous bathing suit that hides anything you want to hide? You know what they found out? Through studies that happiness actually comes by belonging and feeling connected. And then they took us to different places all throughout the world, some of them far poorer, far less developed than the United States, where the happy meter was far higher, far higher. They found that people connected. They took time for one another. They built relationships. They supported each other. They shared in joys and sorrow. They shared food and at table together. They were there to help provide a helping hand in childbirth or sickness or in woes or when somebody's job was lost. It was not a problem. They helped you find more work and fed you in the meantime. They found the happiness meter, what we really say is joy, was through connection and through belonging, through supporting each other, through, I would say, in my words, being God's people. They found that whole individualistic thing that the United States built itself on, it is great for a cowboy western movie, rocks. It is so cool for an action movie where I do it all myself. Or, I do it all myself. I took my husband's shotgun and protected us. But you know what? We're missing something when we're so individualistic. 
we are missing. We are missing being woven together. They found that cultures that are different than ours, they take time for rest. Sabbath is what I would call that as a faith leader. Sabbath isn't just reading the Bible and praying and going to worship. Sabbath is a replenishing of soul. A replenishing of soul. That means if you love, I don't know what it is, uh, we made really fancy northwestern Seattle type salmon this week. My son is part of a cooking club and that salmon, it came out after we worked with the chef at Edwin's over a Zoom call, it came out like salmon you could buy in Seattle at a five-star restaurant. It was on a bed of rice pilaf that had onions chopped in it and herbs. And then the salmon had a, they called it a compound butter. It had chopped up parsley in it and a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. And then it was all mixed together with lemon juice. And then it was made cold again so you could slice it and put it on top of your salmon when you were done. There was fresh asparagus to the side we found out, ooh, you can blanch your asparagus to hold on to the color so it looks really nice. If cooking is what it is for you on Sabbath, fantastic. Heaven forbid, I will be chased down by the same people that chased Jesus down. But if that's part of replenishing your soul, great. If taking a hike in the outdoors is part of replenishing your soul, Go and replenish and then connect with others. Maybe you connect with them over some cup of tea around the fireplace. Maybe you have one other person in to your house that's in your bubble, that's safe, vaccinated, and you just sip tea or cocoa or whatever it is you like to sip in front of the fireplace. Maybe with thick woolly socks on and your toes outstretched as you put them up on the recliner. Maybe it's connecting where you know a neighbor's been sick. And so you make a batch of chicken noodle soup and you bring it over and you just fill their heart so that they can curl up in bed after having warm soup and feel better. Maybe it's in doing something good for somebody who doesn't have as much as you have. This week I met with somebody around how we might help Refugees coming in from Afghanistan, a whole lot are being resettled to Cleveland and Akron. People coming with no furniture, no clothing, no food, looking for jobs, how we might help. And as we dreamt, as we prayed about what that might look like and whether or not that might be a ministry for our church, as we prayed, the person that was giving me all the information said, you know, I have a really nice Christmas tree that I'm not going to use anymore. Do you know anybody in your congregation maybe that could use a really pretty six-foot tree? So I called a family and I asked, if I had a tree, would that be helpful for your family this Christmas? And you could literally hear the smile on the other end of the phone. They said, oh, that'd be great for our children. So I Picked up that tree Thursday, got it in the back of my car. It might have even been Friday. I can't remember which day now. And drove it over to their place, put the tree together out front of their place, and just walked it in with huge smiles, going, oh, this really makes Christmas for our family and our kids. Little things, just a tree, right? We were talking about how to lay out the plans for what might be this extravagant ministry. And what really happened was a tree brought peace and joy and hope. What else can we do that Sabbath connection with each other? Does Sabbath happen, have to happen only on Sundays? Can I only be kind and feed you or connect with you on a Sunday? Do you not matter to me the rest of the week? That's kind of absurd, isn't it? Because I love you and you matter very much to me. That's absurd because I'm a Christian and I live as a person of God. And so everywhere I go, every day, how I interact, how you interact is as a person of God. 
It just means at least once a week, at least once a week, take extra time to connect with God. That's what our Sabbath commandment's about. At least once a week on that seventh day. But the rest of the time, we can connect, which brings deep joy. That happy meter, and literally the documentary, you can find this, it's on Netflix, it's called Happy, is all about people being there for each other. In situations that some of us would consider so rustic, so rural, so poor, that we'd be like, how could they possibly be happy? But they're so much happier than the average American. So much more connected, united. So much more held as community, beloved community. We can be that too. We can be that too. So another thing our family did this week that was something big that came out, you probably heard this too, was on Friday, do you know what movie was released all around the nation? Anybody ever heard of West Side Story? West Side Story. Steven Spielberg, huge movie maker, made his first musical. West Side Story, 60 years after the first film was made, they got all kinds of Oscar awards and that everybody knows, that people do parodies of, people love, people sing to. It's been on Broadway. It's been done by high school theater. West Side Story. So we went and saw it Friday night with our masks, very distanced from people, with our vaccination cards in hand. And it was amazing. But you know what came to my mind? West Side Story tells a story of love that's been killed. Love, wonder, beauty, community that have rifled and murdered each other. And what I thought of, it just sat weird with me the next day. And I thought about this yesterday, and I thought, you know what movie is of joy that is also from the west side of New York City? West Side City, West, sorry, West Side Story, if you don't know, is from the west side of middle Manhattan. It's pretty much where the Lincoln Center currently is. The Lincoln Center is where the, the Metropolitan Opera sings. It's where the New York Orchestra is. Beautiful buildings now. And West Side Story takes place when the old apartment slums were being taken down. Very Puerto Rican neighborhood. And there's another movie, another musical. Wow. Lynn Manuel, I'm getting his name butchered every single time. You guys help me with it. Lynn Manuel Manuel Miranda. There we go. You guys can say it louder than I am. Ready? Lynn Manuel Miranda did another movie that came out this summer also about the west side, a little bit further up on Manhattan. Instead of around 50th and 60th, it's around 170th and 160th. It's a strongly Dominican Republic neighborhood in Manhattan. And that movie was called In the Heights. In the Heights, that area of Manhattan is called Washington Heights because it's right next to the Washington, the George Washington Bridge that crosses over from New Jersey into New York City. You could drive it. If you drove over there in about six hours, minus some traffic going into Manhattan, which might add two hours for you, but in that traffic, you can go right across the George Washington Bridge, right into Manhattan, right around 176th. And so that is called the Washington Heights. The movie is called In the Heights. All kinds of dance numbers, all kinds of musical, all kinds of goodness, goodness that comes out of these families. There's actually a character named Nina, so we all went, whoa, there's a Nina. Nina is a college student who went all the way to California to Stanford, really smart college student, representing her people, but also not feeling like she fit in all the way in a really exclusive university. But it's a beautiful story. It's a story of community coming together. It's a story of people supporting one another. And yes, there's conflict because life and movies have conflict. But it's much more uplifting. I thought, here's West Side Story, continuing to be the story of racism that continues to be alive in our nation, that continues to be degrading of people, 
to where we hurt and hurt and hurt so that hatred flares and more hurt is caused by that and destruction of love. And we have this story in the Heights. It doesn't have to be a Dominican Republican family. It could be your family. It could be my family where we support each other where we cheer each other on, where we have dreams and aspirations, where we help our neighbors. And maybe even when one of our neighbors that we love passes away, we lift up and celebrate. We mourn, but we remember as community, beloved community. So if you are feeling lonely or isolated, and especially looking at our online worshipers, If you are feeling lonely or isolated coming into Christmas, I want you to know you are part of our beloved community. I want you to know that I am looking out on a congregation here and a congregation online that loves each other, that affirms each other, accepts each other, celebrates each other, that does come alongside with one another, woven together when someone's sick and supports you that is there in childbirth, is there in death, is there in beloved weddings, is there in sickness, is there when we buy a house, is there when we have somebody return from college, is there when we go through life as beloved community, connected as people of God. If you feel lonely, I want you to reach out to Pastor Jill and I. You can go and you can do our prayer tab that's online at our website, goodshepherdchristianchurch.org. You can put it privately to Pastor Jill and I and just say, I need more connection. And I will connect you with an elder. I will connect you with others in our beloved congregation. If you are sitting here in worship today and you feel lonely, you feel isolated, you feel like you don't have a place to be heard or no one really understands your path, I know we have many here who have grief this year, health issues, We have others who just need love. Tell me. I will connect with you. I will have our elders connect with you. For you are held in beloved community. How much is enough? I will tell you that love is abundant. Love is abundant. You never run out of it. And the more you share, the more you end up having The more you share, the more you end up having. If you need food, we'll bring you food. If you need someone to pray with, we will pray with you. If you need someone to talk to to really hear the longings of your heart, we will listen. How much is enough? John trained his new recruits, his new Christians being baptized. He said, share your food, feed one another, be happy, be joyful, Do not harass one another, but bring peace, bring hope, and let us live in joy. Thanks be to God. Amen. that right. Can you all hear me? Yes, no, yay, no. There we go. Hello? Okay. So we come to our time of prayer, and as Pastor Anita shared at the beginning of the service, we hold in our hearts all those who are suffering, and especially those who are suffering in the wake of the tornadoes that uh, ripped across now six states, devastating the lives and the property and the hope of dozens. We pray for all those who are suffering, especially in the season of Advent, for those who wait for the arrival, the return of our source of hope itself, our our source of life. We pray for all those right now who are enduring hardship. As has been our practice for recent weeks, uh, as I pray, join me in the bolded words uh, above or on your screen at home as we pray in unison. And we say together, Make of my heart a stable, 
a house for the holy, a warm and sturdy place for joy to live and grow. In this moment, we open the doors of our hearts to honesty before God about what we've done and left undone that created less joy in a hurting world. Let us breathe out this regret and breathe in the life-giving, forgiving Spirit of God and out again with the peace of Christ. And we say together, make of my life a stable, a house for the holy, a warm and sturdy place for joy to live and grow. In this moment, we open the doors of our lives to the call of the Spirit, inviting us to become more than we can ask or imagine. Let us breathe out our fear and breathe in the courage of the Spirit of God and out again with the peace of Christ. And we say together, make of our church a stable, a house for the holy, a warm and sturdy place for joy to live and grow. In this moment, we open the doors of this church, filling it with the compassion of Christ for all those who are struggling. We remember and pray for those who are suffering economic hardship and insecurity and basic needs. May abundance be shared. Those who are suffering mentally, finding it difficult to cope, may paths open and hope return. Those who are suffering illness or injury, may healing abound. Those who are suffering loneliness and isolation, may companionship and solace arrive. Those who are suffering discrimination, fear, and violence, may they know respect, respite, and safety. May the advent of compassion be born in us, reside within us, move outward from us, making a house for the holy that is each and every child of God. We pray all this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into a time of trial and temptation, but rescue us, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Amr. I asked him, since Pastor Jill is off this Sunday, having a bit of rest and respite, if he would, as elder chair, just help me. And I appreciate another voice, and I appreciate your prayers. So thank you. We come to this time of communion, so if you are worshiping at home, I invite you to have your communion elements in front of you and for others. We come knowing that peace matters. Jesus tells us, there will always be the poor amongst us. We know for certain there will always be those being born and those who are passing on from this life to another. We will have struggles. But we also know that God is with us always in everything. And that if we are, as the church, we are God's love. We are Jesus' hands and feet. Then we are active love for one another. We come to this table knowing we're not perfect. That's why in Amr's prayer we breathe out our regrets and we are filled with the Spirit. This table accepts us imperfectly and loved. This table also comes where Jesus has ways for us to move forward to become who God wants us to be right now not who you were at 25 or who you were at 15 or who you were at 10, who you are now in this time. And so we come. We come seeking that peace 
but also come to be nurtured, to be strengthened, so that we can be peacemakers, just as we are with our own gifts. We come knowing that Jesus collected a vagabond of followers. He had 12 in the upper room with him, fishermen, farmers, shepherds, different people, carpenters, and they were disciples. He said, come and follow me, and they did. And that last night together in Jerusalem, in the upper room, he broke bread with them. He took it, and after giving a blessing, he broke it. He said, take and eat. This is my body, my body broken for you. And then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he poured from it, and he said, this is my new covenant, my covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sin of all. And he said to them, at the most perplexing time, because this was the evening of his arrest. So he says to them, as they are gathered for the Passover meal, whenever you eat of this bread, or you drink of this cup of forgiveness, do so in remembrance of me. Our elder, Rich Peju, brings us our elder prayer. Gracious God, just as you sent John the Baptist to prepare the way for Jesus, help us to clear the path in our hearts too. Show us the distractions in our lives that block us from worship of you this Advent. Lord, we await your coming. As we celebrate the first Advent, the first coming, we look toward the day where we will see you face to face. Give us hearts that look for your coming on a daily basis. Help us to live our lives where we are constantly seeking your presence. Show us today how we need to be refined purified, forgiven. Give us the strength to ask for forgiveness and then to change our ways. The bread and the cup we share as brothers and sisters in your service help to remind us of your promise through peace, hope, joy, and love. Through the grace of your presence, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Many imaginative tales have been spun about the inn. Lots of different stories have been written, and people that were involved in the story have been put into books. There have been caricatures drawn up. But as we said before, we don't really know much about the inn from the Bible. Another theory that goes with the inn is really interesting. It connects us to what we just did for communion. The thought was that people, when we were gathering in the upper room, that the home's large rooms were above their stables. That their stables were the lower floor where the animals were kept. And then they would go up to the upper room where their living space was. So maybe, maybe each and every home can be a birthing place for more goodness in the world. It suggests that in the house of God, maybe we have our lower places where we tend to our animals, where we tend to goodness, where we tend to the birthing 
of the baby Jesus child. It suggests that this house of God, the Good Shepherd Christian Church, might contain a surprising nook or a cranny that could house a holy endeavor for bringing more joy into someone's life. I hold that in prayer. I breathe life into that. What will it be? Will it be the revisioning of our meal ministry, our welcome table? What will it be like? Will there be other ministries that come that we can do Matthew 25 where we feed the hungry and clothe the naked? What will it be where we bring joy? We birth joy into a world of such need. One way that I suggested earlier that we can do right now, not in the future, but right now is by supporting Week of Compassion, by lifting up our financials and helping those in need right now for relief aid. Again, you can do that by going to goodshepherdchristianchurch.org, giving online or giving today in our offering box or next week or throughout the week. Another way, we are beginning our Christmas special offering. This supports our region, the Christian Church in Ohio. We are going to give this Sunday and next Sunday for this special offering. And here are a few things, just a few things, that our region does. The Christian Church in Ohio nurtures persons for ministry, preparing them for ordination and commissioning. The Christian Church in Ohio gathers children, youth, and adults in summer camps. The Christian Church in Ohio provides care for our pastors, encouragement to lay leaders, and support in pastoral transitions. Our Christian Church in Ohio assists pastors and congregations to honestly confront racism in our own time as part of our larger Disciples of Christ pro-reconciliation, anti-racism movement. So I invite you, we invite you to share your gift, your gift of the Christmas offering, supporting the ministries of our region as we continue our witness to God's love in our midst. Thanks be to God for Reverend Alan Harris, our new regional minister. Thanks be to God for in our own congregation, those who serve the region, Terry Bartlett as a regional elder, Diane Bartlett serves on the finance team. Thanks be to God for everyone here who's been touched by camp. Oh, I know there's a whole lot of us. Thanks be to God that the work of this ministry continues. Give generously to support Good Shepherd Christian Church, to support others where we have Let's Share. Now, before we sing our last hymn together, I want to tell you a little bit about it. We're going to sing, What Child Is This? And it invites, remember this, peasants and kings to claim Christ as their own. It's the one and the all where the hymnal changes it at times to glory to God. It was written by Chatterton Dix. And this was, Dix was not a clergy person like most of the hymn writers that wrote for the 19th century. He was a businessman in England. And he asked the question, Why lies he in such mean a state? Why lies he in such mean a state? Referring to the stable. And the original second verse answers this by connecting the humble wooden birth manger to the wood of the cross born at his death. It says, why lies he here in such mean a state where ox and ass are feeding? Good Christian fear for sinners here, the silent word is pleading. Nails, spear, shall pierce him through. The cross be born for me, for you. Hail, hail, the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. To joy, true joy. True joy, brothers and sisters, acknowledges the suffering of the world. True joy It's not a toxic positivity that pushes it down. But true joy recognizes suffering, and it invites all people, regardless of status, to know Christ's love and grace and joy as a healing salve for the soul, 
So may we offer warm laps, soft lullabies, a comforting casserole, generous words, financial gifts to help soothe a hurting world. Let's stand and let's sing together. of God, may God's door of welcome open wide, swing wide open in your heart and in your life. May Christ's humble first dwelling remind you of the plenty that you already know, and may the Spirit lead, lead you into more possibility, more hospitality than you can ever imagine, making room at the end for all. May it be so for you. May it be so for us. May it be so for this church. In Jesus' name, go in peace. Amen. <laughs>